Welcome to Consider Yourself Hugged. I am your host, Tammy West, and today you are listening to part two of Mental Health and the Church. I wanted to to at least give you a quick welcome because the episode picks up right where it left off last time. If you haven't listened to part one, there will be a link in the show notes. Definitely go take a listen or a look, depending on where you're coming from. Go ahead and and do that first. Uh, You don't have to, but we left off at sort of a riveting point, I think, and we pick right back up from where we left, left off last time. So that's it. Here we go. And so I don't know if you saw Gracie, I sent something and it was by email. It was from my hometown newspaper. Oh yeah. Let's talk about that. Cause that's and, just what she um, was talking about. Yeah. And I don't know, I don't know what the best way, I mean, obviously we'll have it in, I mean, we let me it share it. I mean, and again, I love my hometown. I love this paper, but this clip was under a segment called words of wisdom and it's um, titled Michelle. suicide or salvation. Michelle, did you hear me say I was going to share it? Oh, okay. Sorry. You No, you can keep talking. I just wasn't sure if you heard me say that I would pull it up and share it. So okay. at least. And so what, what do you think it'd be? Do you think it'd be best if I just read it? It's fairly short, but I mean, it's not. It'd take a couple of minutes to read. Yeah, go ahead. I think and this way people can see it. And because, you know, some people will be watching on YouTube and some people will just be listening. So if you could read it, that would be great. Okay. Um, And again, it's Suicide or Salvation is the title under this segment, Words of Wisdom. It says, then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And then at Matthew 27, three through five, and it says suicide is only an option to someone who gives up on God. Forgiveness is with God. If you, Lord, should make iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Psalm 133 um, and four. Christians must be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Ephesians 4:32. Whatever have you have done, if you repent, God can forgive it and Christians must forgive you. And so there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah, keep, I'm going to, as we know the world of doing things at home, I have to let my dog out. So keep, keep, <laughs> keep talking. Come on, buddy. Come on. Go, go, go. So uh, first of all, I mean, I want to get your opinion, Gracie, because, you know, obviously I read it. I had an opinion, but I'd like to hear your opinions um, on it. First. I'm going to, I'm going to share it again, just so as we talk about it, you can see it, Grace, you can see it. And people who are watching on YouTube can see it. <clears throat> well, first of all, cause I did read it and I, as you started being like, Oh, I remember that. My initial reaction is that is a very uh, superficial explanation or exploration. I don't even know if it's, we can call it an exploration of what a lot of people struggle with. Um, cause it's so much it's so much more it's deeper than that you know it's not so simple as that is um and i and again i think it's very because of that it's very diminishing to people's experience life experience the other thing is i'm all about forgiveness absolutely the thing is though is that if i'm struggling because my brain doesn't produce the right amount of chemicals or i'm struggling because i was the victim of abuse or i'm struggling because i've had trauma in my life I have to have somebody forgive me to make me feel better. There, that's victimizing. And so, yeah, so my initial reaction, this is very superficial. It's diminishing and it's victimizing, which, how is that going to lead me to Christ? I don't understand. So yeah, I had a pretty strong reaction to that. And I understand, I think I understand the context of this. Absolutely. And I had a pretty strong reaction. Yeah, I did. I did too. Since Michelle wanted you to speak first, I, I feel a little bit slighted, but I'm okay with it. And I'll cross <laughs> it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you went to let the dog out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, I, I have a couple thoughts too. The first thing, you know, I, when you see, first of all, 
if someone is struggling to the point where they are, let, let's really, let's really think about taking their own life, putting a rope or a gun or dr- like taking the, the thing that most of us strive to preserve to the nth degree, what kind of pain must that person be in to do that? And so when you look at it is, it's only an option if you give up on God and then you must be forgiven. Um, someone who is struggling with suicide, that is not going to be helpful at all. And I think it just, again, like what you said before, showing grace and love and knowing that that's writing that is, I'm sure somebody thought was extremely helpful. Um, but it just, I think is the way that I feel is, it's another example of how we have to, we have to have a different message when it comes to this topic. Um, you both know, Gracie may not know, I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. Years ago, Michael, my youngest son, he must have been 20. And one of his very close friends took his own life. He hanged himself. And And so I was, I'd never experienced anything like that. And I remember trying to comfort. I went to the, the service, the memorial, and I was trying to comfort my son. And I said, you know, Michael, I, I'm so sorry. I, I believe, you know, he'll be in a better place. Or, you know, I said one of those and Michael said, mom, he didn't believe in God. So then I left there just so angry and I would go to church and watch people raise their hands and sing songs and the message. I make crap up every time I tell the story. Maybe the message was about finances or I don't know what it was about, but whatever it was, I was just getting angry and angrier thinking, okay, if we really believe what we say as Christians, that there's a heaven or hell, and if we really believe that that's true, and then like, what are we doing here? Just talking about anything else other than trying to bring people to Jesus. And so I'm angry. I'm talking to my friends about this whole concept of if you commit suicide, you're going to hell. And many of them said, I'm sorry, but that's just, that's the way it is. And I'm like, well, let me just tell his mother that. Let me just call his mother and say, oh, I'm really sorry, but your son is writhing in hell right now. Finally, Tim was like, you, my husband, if you don't, Tim was like, you really need to um, calm down. He said, you don't know what God was doing with him. You don't know anything about what was his relationship with God. You know nothing. You don't have to fix this. You don't have to be angry. You can you can start spreading a different message. You can, you know, but you don't, cause I wanted to know where is Jake? Is Jake? Okay. How does his mom feel? And I'm never going to know until, you know, the end of time. And so I'm so glad. I mean, Michelle, what did you think about that? You, you having sent it to us. So when I first read it, like I was, I mean, I was, I mean, honestly, I was pretty mortified. And the first thing I did, I seen it, I have to, um, business partners, because I, I work at a, a community mental health center, and then I have another practice, and I, and I sent it to them, and I said, tell me what you think about this, because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just me, you know, I wanted to make sure, like, am I reading this right, maybe, because as as Tammy knows, I mean, there have been things that have been kind of like trigger points for me in the past that, um, and so I wanted to get their opinion beforehand, and then, you um, the main thing was when it said that people who um, commit suicide have given up on God, that haven't talked to a lot of people. That is not my experience at all. I think sometimes they give up on people. It's mm-hmm. not God. And they know that God still loves them. And maybe they want to, I mean, they want to go to a better place. They want to go be with God. And and not everyone believes that if you um, commit suicide, you lose your salvation. I mean, I think that's you know, different people believe right. different things, but I think they've given up on other people. Sometimes they've given up on their selves. I hear people say, you know, I'm, you know, my family would be better off without me rather than living with me the way I am now. Right. So I, I mean, I've, I've, I've honestly, I mean, I'm sure there may be that someone out there, but I've never had someone come in and be like, you know, I, I'm, I I want to end my life because I've given up on God. That's not the conversation. And so I, I felt like that was unfair and I felt like it was a little shaming. It was kind of like, well, you can't do that because if you do that, then you've given up on, 
on God. And, and so I, I did feel like it was superficial. And like, as, as y'all was, were saying, and I felt like it was very skewed towards, um, you know, people only want to do this if they've got sin in their life. Right. And, you know, you don't have to worry about it because you can be forgiven. Craig was saying, so you, you must have sin. Yes. Yeah. And so it really just like hurt my heart for people who are struggling. And, you know, I'm from a very small town that, that they don't have a lot of mental health services there still. And so when I see things like that, it's, it's a little frustrating. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a lot frustrating. So. Well, who do you think, like when we see things like this, like where was that? I'm sorry. That was in your church. Like the, the, no, it was in um, my hometown newspaper. Like I'm okay. um, like on social media, I like follow them. And so that popped up as one of the things they posted, you know, words of wisdom. When you, when you think about writing something like that or anything else that's addressing mental health, suicide, addiction, any of that, do you think that unless it's a professional, you know, someone who specifically focuses on that, how do you think they really, do they think about their audience? <laughs> like if it's words of wisdom and it's for someone who might be contemplating that, well, here's the thing. I think they do. I think they're thinking of the audience. I also don't, th I think a lot of people are simply unaware because they've not experienced it. They don't understand their audience. Maybe They don't. Well, I think that a lot of people don't realize that they, I think a lot of people do really think that people are overreacting or they're attention seeking, whatever, because they themselves have never experienced it. And, oh, nobody in my family has a mental health issue. None of my friends do because we're all fine. <laughs> right. And so their reality is not reality. Right. And I think this is why it takes something really hard to happen to change their perspective because they simply, do, they, they simply don't perceive it. And, and when you look at this, like there's not like, uh, you know, if, if you need help, reach out here or like suicide prevention network, there's none of those things oh, right. that you often see like as extra help if someone's struggling but, but I think this also leads to because some of the things we were talking about earlier about testimonies and being vulnerable until people feel safe to tell their stories the real stories people are going to still be going around with the illusion of it's not real because it doesn't happen to me it doesn't happen to anybody I know we need to be able to create that vulnerability where people are safe we need to create the safety for vulnerability where people can tell their stories and they're not going to be diminished or demeaned or attacked. And I think that's what we're doing here, mm -hmm. just starting to talk about it. That's what needs to happen. Because until we talk about it. You're right. I am so grateful that I wound up in your world because teaching teaching webinars like this for an EAP, you know, the more you teach things like that, the more you research and the more you learn. And you both know that I did take the mental health first aid class. So I am a mental health first aider. Mm -hmm. um, I know. Woo! And I loved it so much. And so now I'm getting the instructor certification. I'll take that class at the end of, of March, but I've been looking at like mental health first aid. And, and those of you who don't know, mental health first aid is a, is a, actually a very simple program of just being able to be a bridge between someone who might be showing early signs um, or behaviors of um, declining mental health, whether it's a mental health challenge or a mental health crisis and being able to be that bridge, someone who can listen with a non-judgmental ear and maybe just provide, you know, some resources. That's the simplistic version version. Um, but some churches will bring people in to do that very training so that they can understand. And so I, I told you all that I was going to have a conversation with a woman that I know, and we wound up, she wound up not being able to call me, but she sent me some texts and some of these things. And, and I told her completely anonymous. Um, she was someone who shared with me um, that she didn't feel comfortable saying that she was struggling in her church and that she was taking medication. And it's like, so many people we know she is bubbly and happy and you would be like 
what? And so she sent me a lot of encouraging, um, I never know what to call these things, you know, pictures that have words on them. <laughs> They're not memes, you know, the social me things that come across on social media that have, anyway, what do you call them? You can call them memes. Okay. I'm going to call them memes. Yeah. So she sent me a, many of those that were very encouraging and I'm going to, to post those in the show notes, but then she did send me, I won't read it all, but she said, truth told personally, it's hard for me to talk about mental illness, illness almost anywhere and trust the listener to even try to understand or trust they won't have automatic bias or make assumptions that are just not accurate. For those who have never come face to face with a true mental illness or experienced a chemical imbalance in a loved one that caused irrational behaviors or anxiety or fears or paranoia for those people who haven't experienced it, then I'm sure those outsiders can truly, let's see, for those who haven't experienced that, da, 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 she said, those can't understand it in a compassionate way. If they haven't helped another struggling um, anyway, she, she goes on and on and talks about how painful it is. And at the end, she just really says, in my heart, I hope you hear my heart. It's really hard to talk about, not a topic. It needs us to be brave enough to discuss. And that's what she wanted us to, to basically say, at least from her perspective here is just, it's a topic we need to discuss. And if you've never experienced it, it may be hard to have the compassion. It's not impossible. A lot of people that have never experienced it have compassion, but sometimes it just doesn't happen that way. And also do in the you, church. Do you think it's like when, like kind of going back to your initial story about kind of the, you know, people just like to sit in it. Like, do you perceive that as judgment? Well, my favorite part of that was this, the mental health in air quotes. <laughs> do I perceive it as judgment? Like, do you think when people say things like that, so, I mean, I do think people are trying to help, but is it, is it judgment? Like, are you judging someone else based on whatever? Like when you're saying, you know, people would, shouldn't sit in it. It absolutely feels like judgment. I don't know exactly, you know, maybe where you might be coming from with that question, but it, it feels, and it feels like, like I've never attempted suicide. I thought about it, you know, during the mental hospital stay it was in my medical records. You know, they took all my stuff away to make sure I didn't hurt myself. I'm not sure I would have done it, but it feels that comment feels very similar to, oh, people who threaten to kill themselves or aren't really going to, they just want attention. Well, kind of where I was going with it. And then, I mean, I would love to hear um, Gracie's opinion is I feel like you can either approach something with love or you can approach it with judgment. And I feel like with other illnesses, like, it, you know, say, you know, you have a long history of cancer in my family. You know, you don't hear people say, well, they just want to sit in that cancer. They just want to sit <laughs> in the misery of that. And you know, but for some reason, when it comes to mental health, it's a different, we perceive it different. And like, we're like, a lot of times we come, you know, with love and compassion through the church. For some reason, it just doesn't seem to be that as much for mental health. Well, I think some of it comes down to the perception of can't versus won't. Right. I, I can't cure cancer with a positive attitude. Hmm. It's not that I won't cure cancer. And so for people, especially if they don't have the experience, it's like, okay, you know what? I had a hard day, but I prayed and I practiced my gratitude exercise. And I was able to recognize that a lot of people have it worse than I do. And it made me feel better, right? So if you don't do the same thing, it's because you're choosing not to, you won't do it. Mm -hmm. So it's a lack and of I, understanding. In and I think cases, they don't realize it's yeah. not an issue of won't. It's an issue of I can't mm -hmm. trust them. Yeah. I'm a psychotherapist. I understand all these things. And when I can't get out of bed, mm -hmm. it's not because I'm not motivated or I don't know what to do or anything else like that. So I think that's part of it is that people, they confuse the two. Can't it feels it. like it's almost on this because you use the example of cancer. 
But what about obesity? And what about diabetes? When you go out and you see someone eating donuts when they have diabetes, it's like they're, Gracie, you put it, there's almost like this spectrum from can't to won't and things in between, right? Like you cannot cure, can I mean, you can make some good choices for cancer, but you definitely, but obesity and diabetes, you know, you might be able to make some choices that you really could. And then it just, and so when you see somebody who's struggling with mental health and they appear sad, you know, or down or, you know, just really upset or really upset, really anxious, and it comes out, well, then that feels probably really uncomfortable to people. And I told, I've told you guys, I think both of you, I lost a friend over my anxiety and didn't know it until years later when she wrote me and apologized and said, I thought that it was because of my divorce, but it was because she didn't understand my anxiety and how I couldn't just cope with life. And it was only after her child was diagnosed with OCD. And she was like, I just didn't know. I didn't know. I don't, but I feel like even with those things, like they're, um, like it's not considered unbiblical to take medicine, even if you have type two diabetes, or even if you have high blood pressure, it's not considered unbiblical, that, you know? And, and so even though like a lot of type two diabetes, sure, it could be controlled with diet and exercise, but we don't treat that the same if they choose to take medicine as it seems to be treated if, they, if somebody chooses to take medicine for mental health. Do you feel like a sort of a bar or a gauge as to how people really feel about mental health is their thoughts on medication? Um, I mean, as somebody that prescribes medication, I'd be biased, right? I mean, because that's my, you know, I mean, in this, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know that bias is the right word, but like, I have seen a lot of things. I have a certain perspective from that, but um, I don't know. Maybe my answer is, I don't know. Well, I think Maybe people's, I can't answer it. Yeah, I think okay. people's perception okay, of medication answer? can be symbolic or indicative of some of their larger views. Absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, I have actually heard people say before, and this has not been recently, that taking medication indicates a lack of faith. I mean, they some people will just flat out say it. Well, I've had people say it's cheating. Oh, I haven't heard that. Yeah. In the, especially in the recovery community, which I've already said I'm a part of, like there are individuals in the recovery community who feel like medication of any kind, not everybody, but medication of any kind is cheating. I've had actually um, a couple of people make some recommendations to me because I really did struggle a lot during, during the pandemic, during COVID, you know, the height of lockdown and losing everything and all that. So I really struggled and went back on medication for the first time in like 20 years, 25 years. But I had a few people recommend other things to me that were physical, but I was like, well, then, and I know that the people who did that were anti-medication. So I thought, well, if, if, if I shouldn't take medication, then why should I try this? Because I think what you're saying is I just need to have more Jesus. Then why is this okay? But this isn't okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like how come I can take an ibuprofen for my headache, which doesn't actually <laughs> fix anything, but I can't take, you know? Yeah. I, I get that. What can we, what can we end on, on a, I mean, do we, do we each have maybe a, a thought about how to move forward on this? I feel like we'll have more conversations. We can't fix everything tonight. Maybe the next time we can fix it all, right? Two sessions. I don't know. Right. We can change the world completely. Yes, absolutely. Well, we are changing the world. We are definitely we are. Changing the world, but I mean, any final thoughts about what might be, you know, what's something we can do going forward, even if it's just the three of us, what can people do to better move this conversation forward when it comes to the church? Listen, love, and talk. Listen, love, and talk. That's beautiful. Yeah, I love that's that. That's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Gracie. Set the bar high there. So now the rest of us, what do you got, Michelle? <laughs> I mean, I was going to say, you know, the same thing, like approach it with love listen you know understand that god doesn't you know always have the same path for everyone and just because somebody's on a different path from you doesn't mean it's the wrong path i love that 
because there are different paths. And, you know, I, I feel like just my take would just be that um, I am always going to try to err on the side of love and compassion when it comes to any topic. And especially if someone is struggling, I feel like, you know, it's not my job to judge or it's not my job to do any of that. My job is just to love and do the best that I can to help those people who are suffering. And I think that that's all we can do for each other. Y'all are amazing. So <laughs> do you think it'd be helpful? Like if we, like, a, like if you guys gave like what people could do within, like if they wanted to, to start a conversation or make a change in their church, what they could if there's anything, do you have any suggestions, Gracie, or? Actually, I have a very practical suggestion. I mean, other than the, you know, listen, let me talk. Um, and this is kind of a moment with the mental health first aid. Go ahead and Google, are you okay? Oh. The are you okay program was designed by a family out of New Zealand who lost a family member to suicide. And just some really, really nice resources out there about how to have these conversations. We'll post awesome. that in the show notes. And then you're going to talk about mental health first aid. I'll post that in the show notes. And I will also post, I haven't looked around at it yet. So I, I will look around. I'm sure it's fine. But on the Saddleback Church site, there's actually a tab you can click um, if you want to start a ministry in your church. So a mental health ministry in your church. So um, let's just, let's commit to the three of us if we can think of anything else um, before we get ready to to drop the episode, whatever we, whatever we can think of and come up with, we will put it in there for you. So sound good. Lovely. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for giving your time to us. As we ask you every week, please. I say we now it's back to, I, I forgot we weren't really a, we, but maybe we'll be a, we, who knows anyway. Um, thank you. Subscribe, download, invite your friends. If you're a woman and you're not part of the private Facebook group, do that. That's in the show notes. Um, I'll have whatever information Gracie wants me to post about her. And then Michelle, I have her info unless she decided she doesn't want to be contacted in any way, but, um, cause she has a private, a private practice in middle Tennessee. So I'll post all of that in the show notes and Gracie, what we say at the end is I'll tell you what we say, and then we'll say it together. We say until next time, consider yourself hugged and it's always bad okay so i'm gonna count three two one let's try that and then we'll say until next time consider yourself hugged everybody got it okay three two one until, until next, time, next time consider, consider yourself, yourself hugged, hugged. <laughs> always terrible but not too bad